Thanks a lot, Sabrina. That's a very generous introduction. And as I listened to you, I thought, you know, all of you are going to think I've never actually had a job. And I want to convince you I have. I actually began my career. My first job was a tour guide in Cinderella's Castle in Walt Disney World. So I have private sector experience uh, that I bring to my job as a business school dean. It's a huge treat to be with you because we all are feeling the same joys and opportunities and challenges and pain. Uh, in our industry. It is uh, the fodder of newspaper articles. All of our faculty uh, have expressed interest and concern, certainly our students and prospective students, and our alumni and, and board uh, leaders. Uh, I announced recently that I'm going to be stepping down as Dean of Columbia Business School. This is my last academic year in doing it, so I'll try to give you a sense of some reflections uh, that I have. And, if you're interested, I wrote an essay broader than the subject this morning of digital era called The Business of Business Schools. And if you send me an email, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll send it to you. I just had my school's board meeting uh, in Paris because it was part of a global reunion. And I get asked the same questions all the time. And the question was, you know, which school am I most worried about or schools in terms of competition? And my answer was the nuns. Like a puzzled look, like you mean ladies and habits and things like that? I said, no, none. Like, don't go to business school. I'm more worried about that than my head to head competition. And part of it is the subject that we're going to talk about today on, uh, on digital, uh, digital transformation. The period that I've been blessed to be a dean, and certainly the period going forward, is one of enormous disruption uh, in our industry. There are a number of factors in that. That was the essay that I wrote. But this one today on technology is clearly one of the key ones. But I actually come to this with a sense of great optimism. I think this is far more an opportunity for us than it is a threat, uh, although it can, be, uh, it can be difficult. When people say technology, digital disruption in business schools or anything else, uh, you think change. So the question is, is that true? Now, actually, the answer is yes and no. Now, I'm sorry, you invited an economist to speak to you, so we're allowed to you know, equivocate on one hand and, and the other hand. And there's a mistaken quote, it's, it's famous, but it comes to be mistaken from uh, Zhou Enlai uh, in 1972, where he purportedly said that uh, when asked about the impact of the French Revolution, that it was just too early to tell. Uh, actually, the quote isn't real, but it's great. It sort of says, sometimes disruptions take a long time to work their way through and, and be felt. If you will permit me one economic observation uh, before I dive in, economists who study productivity growth, and I'm one of them, will note that there is often a significant lag between the introduction of a new general purpose technology and seeing its effect in productivity. Bob Solow, Nobel Prize winner in economics, famously quipped in the 1980s that you see productivity everywhere except in the productivity statistics. And why is that? If you go back to big general purpose technologies, just to highlight a few, electrification, the internal combustion engine, mainframe computing, the internet, and what I'll talk about a little today in artificial intelligence, all of those took a long time to actually transform the economy. The reason, I think, is apropos for us in business schools. What took a long time for a general purpose technology to be felt was not about science. It was about organizational design. Factories had to be reimagined with electrification. The way a factory was designed before electrification was inefficient in the new world. The internal combustion engine changed the way we think about approaching work and travel Likewise with computing and so on. Now I make this point in a business school audience because when we think about digital and tech as a disruptor, it has to change the way we do things. So I'm very pleased, and certainly my wife is very pleased, I have a market leading freshman textbook in economics. That's a nice thing. It also has a digital experience version. And when I first went to Pearson, my publisher, they said, let's digitize your book, because it does well. I said, digitizing my book, that's a complete waste of time. I mean, what's the difference between reading a book on a screen and reading it on a page? So I took the challenge of saying, suppose I didn't have a constraint of a printed page. Paragraph by paragraph, how would I tell a story? Should it be a video? Should it be a picture? Should it be curve shifting? Should it be words? 
Technology to be effective, take that textbook example, has to change the way you think. The same is going to be true for us. I think it's how we adapt as business schools to the technology disruption around us that's going to shape the experiential learning that gets young people to part with the large amounts of money we're asking from them for tuition and for foregone, uh, for foregone wages. I think it's going to change the future of business education. It's going to change the future of the MBA itself. And while it's not the subject of today, ask me about it if you like, I think it will change a number of ways we educate people for a broader, uh, broader social purpose. In my remarks today, I'm going to use the lens of what I know best, which is my own school. But I will try to bring some uh, observations from other areas, too, and we'll certainly look forward to talking with you at the end in terms of questions. So the way I approach this uh, assignment uh, I was given is really in three parts to talk first about who is learning in this world of technology disruption, and then how and what they are learning, and then at least <coughs> tee up some challenges and opportunities. So the way I'm going to talk with you about the who part is to put them in three buckets. Uh, one is students, who in my world would be MBA students and Masters of Science students. At many schools, that might include undergraduates as well. The second is uh, alumni. And the third is executives. We, like uh, most leading business schools, have a pretty sizable executive education business that's our way of inhaling and exhaling. We inhale uh, practical problems from the world to our classroom at Columbia, and hopefully we're exhaling faculty talent uh, out there. In terms of how and what they're learning, I'll talk with you about on the student side, the evolution that I see both in what students are interested in and how recruiters approach buying uh, those students and hiring them. How technology can help, perhaps the easy way to say it, with technical skills, but also with soft skills, where you may not think technology is important. It's turned out to be actually the largest use for us uh, there. Uh, and then on the alumni side, talk about ways to use technology for alumni engagement, for, particularly for people who went to any of our schools many years ago, when their subjects of interest have changed a lot, and frankly, the way we teach has changed a lot, giving them a flavor of what it's like uh, back home. And then for executives, uh, trying to come up with using technology as a tool to complement the kind of face-to-face -face interaction they crave with us uh, in executive education. In challenges and opportunities, I'll talk again about those three uh, populations. Uh, for students, uh, talking about changing the way we uh, administer an MBA and how to use online and physical presence as complements, uh, not substitutes. I know my faculty are always worried about substitutability. I'm actually much more interested in, in complementarity. And then for alumni, giving ways to use technology to keep them engaged. Uh, and likewise with executives, although I'll highlight some of the competitors I worry about in exec yet are like my answer for the MBA. They're the nuns. They're people who aren't in our traditional business. They might be McKinsey Academy. They might be Spencer Stewart and others. And I'll, I'll talk about that. So who is learning? Uh, it's an interesting question. Just to talk about um, my own population for a minute, these weights will obviously differ by by schools in the room, I think of us principally as an MBA program. So we don't have undergraduate education, business education at Columbia. We do some classes at Columbia College that are very popular, but uh, our faculty of arts and sciences thinks business is a little too commercial uh, for them, uh, so we, we're, we're restricted there. We have a pretty big MBA program. Uh, we also have a very large executive MBA program. A second group of students we have that is both interested in technology and for whom we are using technology are Masters of Science students. We were talking about this at our table. This is a big area of growth for us. These are younger students than the MBA program. They are experts, if you will. They're interested in narrow, non-general management training. And for at least for our experience, they're a complement and not a substitute for the MBA. They're two very different populations. They want very different things. This group is also very keen to use technology. And then, of course, we have PhD programs uh, in, in areas of business. We have 47,000 alumni uh, all over the world. Uh, and we have exec ed that takes in uh, clients from 77 countries. 
In each of these areas I'll talk with you about this morning, we've been trying to change our organizational design, going back to the point I made about general purpose technologies, to reach them better. So the technology isn't just something they see on a screen, it's actually changing the way we work with them. So now I want to get to that very point. How and what are each of these populations learning, and how does technology, the digital era, change that? So if I think of students, which is the market I, I focus uh, mostly on, if you put technology in the center, think about the game show uh, Jeopardy. If that's the answer, what was the question? Right? So there's some questions around there. So one thing the question might be are things that relate directly to the digital era. So think of these as technical skills. So for example, we like many business schools used to have in our required curriculum, our core, a class uh, that was more operations research focused. That class is now business analytics. It is entirely on big data and artificial intelligence. It's team taught with engineering. Our faculty of engineering sit literally right next door uh, to the business school. That has changed the way we talk about technology. And we think about technology as being deep and broad in the MBA program. The business analytics is, is, is going deep, but also broad in the sense that throughout the required curriculum, we've tried to weave in uh, much more use of technology and discussion of technology uh, in, the, uh, in the economy. A second big change technically with the students is their uh, comfort with technology. I happen to be an electrical engineer uh, by undergraduate training, although I told students in my day, which was so long ago, we literally carried around boxes of punch cards, so I'm not sure my electrical engineering skills are relevant to the world, but I do know that students have an enormous interest in acquiring program. So a third of the MBA students at Columbia, we're a pretty big program, took Python or some other kind of programming course. Now, it's not because they too are engineers, although some of them are, but I think it's more they, to have the lingua franca of business today as a general manager, you can't just try to have a conversation with an engineer or technical person without knowing what they do. So in that sense, SQL, Python, things like Tableau that are the successors to Excel and so on are very much on the minds of the MBA students. We teach that some with our decision risk and operations faculty who tend to be more technical, but also with faculty from the engineering school. We trade with them, by the way, if you're wondering how can I import from engineering, I'm exporting entrepreneurship to them. So that's how we, that's how we square the schools. So we use technology and analytics. Another big area of student interest that's uh, related to digital disruption is fintech and machine learning. So in New York City, of course, we're a hub for fintech investments. And I myself teach a class in the MBA program that I will do with financiers and entrepreneurs uh, in FinTech to give students an idea about what's going on. A lot of student interest as well in um, digital uh, tokens, uh, blockchain, cryptocurrencies. We have courses in the MBA program, as well as artificial intelligence. To me, far more interesting than cryptocurrency is artificial intelligence. That businesses sit on a mountain of data. Uh, introduction kindly mentioned I'm a director of ADP, which isn't so far from here in, in New Jersey. And ADP, we sit on mountains of data because we pay a big fraction of the nation's workforce. And we, like many companies, are just beginning to look at the way we use data to inform clients. And so part of what we're doing with MBA students is to say, you need to be on this. You may not be the coder, but each company for whom you work is going to have this uh, opportunity. We also are using technology to enhance the classroom experience. So when I think back to when I first started teaching uh, in a business school, I was a, an import from economics department. Basically, when students prepared for an MBA, they used to show up for physical math camp, which was kind of like a boot camp uh, in math. We don't do any of that anymore. We have uh, a complete online preparation for the MBA program that's not just math, but every subject area. So we've taken a lot of the pre-core work that we do with MBA students, and we put it online. And the reason is, while all of my students are talented, they're very different. Some students, I happen to teach finance, so some students will come with a great deal of knowledge of finance. Others are very talented, but their experiences in marketing or operations. So this online preparation means that every faculty member in the required curriculum knows that when students show up, 
they've had to take these online courses and there's assessment and so we know that they've done it uh, and, and how they did. We also use technology in, in classroom management. Some faculty have worked on uh, technology to allow uh, in areas where people are using uh, clickers or other uh, response mechanisms to develop word clouds that a professor can see and be able to call on students who answered a particular way. So you could try to illustrate a point by saying, pick a student who got it exactly right and pull them into the conversation. You can also look at somebody way out in right or left field and gently try to figure out why, why they thought that. So that's a, a way we're uh, improving classroom uh, dynamics. We also have some classes, both in the MBA program and EMBA program, that use remote learning as well. So it's a physical classroom, but also Cisco telepresence. And the faculty member may be talking to some of the students in the room, but also some of the students uh, on, on telepresence. It's important for us because we have our programs in New York, but we also have global programs uh, in Asia, in London. And for many executive MBA students, travel is the hard part. And so they actually like this. Sometimes people say, you know, students don't want to use technology in an MBA program. That's not what they paid for. That's not my experience. As long as there's physical contact too, they actually value uh, the use uh, of technology. And finally, it's very important as a complement for us in experiential learning. So often we will take MBA students and executives on immersion trips in New York and around the world, but we use webinars in executive education and the MBA program to provide additional touch points. So in that sense, when I said, is there change, when I teed off, yes and no, yes, we're using technology, but I would argue no, just like the digital textbook is just a different and better experience, that's what we're doing here. It's really the same experience, just being delivered better. What about alumni? Alumni have a number of touch points with us that involve uh, digital, uh, digital disruption. The first is demand for courses. So we actually allow alumni to audit courses for free back at school, as long as there's a seat in the room. They can sign up and do that, and many, many do. And the most popular class this year for alumni, believe it or not, was Intro to Programming Using Python. Where we had the alumni coming in, sitting with the MBA students, and again, business school and engineering uh, faculty members. Uh, we also do that in executive education. We give alumni a discount, and many of the courses that they're most interested in are in digital transformation in marketing, uh, in fintech, uh, and blockchain, and even in general management, understanding technology from the perspective uh, of, the, of the company. So for alumni, a uh, little bit the same as the MBA students, but some differences. Again, they're trying to learn about adaptations in the world since they were in school, uh, and to try to get a sense of what's cutting edge uh, in technology in a business school. And it's a chance for us, uh, you know, since Sabrina generously mentioned development, which is a big part of my job too, to have continued touch points uh, with alumni in a substantive way, rather than my just going out and saying, uh, how about writing me, uh, writing me a check? Executives, here's where I think we've got a huge set of opportunities uh, in technology. The first I would describe as, as just uh, narrow but deep. So de demand for courses that are related to technology, this is particularly true in marketing uh, and finance big growth areas for us. But a second is uh, broad. So let me give you an example. A franchise course for us is in value investing, which is a hallmark of Columbia Business School. So we've always had a lot of success in value investing, an MBA program for executives. But now what technology has enabled us to do is not develop a course on using technology and value investing, but using technology to keep in touch better. So in between physical contacts in executive education and value investing, we have webinars that might feature uh, business people in our networks as well as faculty. As for years, I've believed that one of the special things each of us has is our network. There's only one finance or one accounting or one operations. There's not a Columbia flavor of those things. But I do have some awful special alumni that I can throw at it in exec ed occasionally. Technology enables me to do that. I can't get a big shot to come a lot to class, but I can get a big shot to do an occasional webinar or to uh, participate, uh, to participate uh, online. 
We also use it as a complement. So we have a partnership with uh, HIT Lab, which is a health uh, innovation organization. So we're using ExecEd for people to study how to use digital technologies to transform life sciences research. So we have an agenda in the university that we run in engineering and medicine that's called Research to Revenue, where we try to work with our faculty and scientists to try to bring things to market faster. And we do this in exec ed, sort of working with business people on how do you create that business-oriented culture among scientists and engineers who might typically value innovation for its own sake, but maybe not know the market. Technology helps us with that. We also use technology to uh, link up with our experiential uh, courses, immersion courses uh, in exec ed. For example, we have leadership uh, jazz that's done in, in Harlem and how to co manage complicated stakeholders at the 9-11 Museum, which brought in a lot of different groups. In each of those areas, a lot of technology pre-work is done to complement uh, the program. And then finally, we use technology to enhance the classroom in exec ed. We do this, obviously, when we have online programs, which for us, at least, is our fastest growing uh, area of business in terms of the number of people and the revenue uh, to boot but also as a complement in familiar, open, and custom programs. So again, to the answer, is this a change? Well, yes and no. I mean, it's a change because it's technology, but I would argue what it's enabling us to do is deliver exec ed better than we ever have before. Now, what really brings us to this discussion, and I expect the reason the organizers want to focus on this, is this does create some challenges and opportunities. Uh, yeah, it's fun, uh, it produces new things, but it can also be uh, a, scary, uh, a scary time. What are some of the challenges? Uh, I'm, there are probably zillions, but I'm going to talk about three. One is how rapid advancements in technology are. Uh, a second is who is our competition? You know, I mentioned the nuns. But among the nuns, there's all kinds of different competition for what we do. And there's general changes in the, in the business school uh, landscape. If I think about the first on rapid changes in technology, universities, all of us, are deliberately designed to be, in some sense, fairly conservative organizations. We're radical in one sense. Cutting edge ideas typically come out of universities. But if you, if you look at organizational design, going back to where I started with general purpose technologies, we're a little bit conservative. I was talking with some of you before about the thoughts that uh, I've given our university president on how to find a dean. You don't want somebody who's afraid of changes in organizational design. Keep what's good in a university, but, but, but be flexible. This is particularly important for students, because by the time, again, I'm really in the MBA world, so my students are 28. When they come to us, they're very familiar with a lot of technology that they've used in the workplace, and they're looking for us to meet them at that point of need. So that's going to be a, a very, very big challenge. A second issue, challenge for students, um, is the fact that so many non-research-based institutions are now uh, competition. So if I think about the startup scene, where, which is particularly hot in New York, although not even 15, 20 years ago, it's very hot now. If I think of General Assembly, Code Academy, things like that, those are part of my competition for student mindshare as well. I've tried to, to switch to co-opetition. I brought General Assembly in with me. We were doing things jointly together rather than trying to fight them. Corporate universities as well. McKinsey Academy, I would really highlight. Think about what I described in our exec ed. I'm taking business people in my network, mine are called alumni, and I take faculty leaders and I put them together using technology to help deliver exec ed. That's the model I described for you a few minutes ago. Now what if I were running McKinsey? They're doing this, except they've got more money than I've got. So what they have, Instead of alumni, call it client leader, famous CEO, and instead of a tenured faculty member, call it a McKinsey partner coming together to talk about problems in executive education. McKinsey will assure everybody in this room that they're not really trying to be in our business. They are very much trying to be in our business. And I think uh, the idea for all of us is how do you complement, how do you work with the McKinsey uh, academies of the world? Apple University. Uh, is another example of a corporate uh, coming into this business. And then also the recruiting firms. Both Corn Ferry and Spencer Stewart are making significant investments in this area. And again, I don't think we have to view this as a pure threat. We have enormous talent 
inside our institutions. We have alumni, we have faculty, and, and we shouldn't be afraid of this, but we should acknowledge it. For alumni, there's a common thread, you know, the comments I hear all over the world is, you know, why should I stay in such close touch with you when I can do online anywhere? So we have to be able to persuade alumni that what we're providing, either in blended learning or our own online, is the way for them to keep in touch with us. And then executives, in exec ed itself, again, there's going to be this uh, worry that will executives continue to come to research-based business schools for programs, or might they choose corporate providers as well? Our prosperity here depends on our being two things. One is adaptable, that is flexible organizational design, but also that we're providing the best experiential learning. I continue to believe we can do that as a group better uh, than anybody else. What about opportunities? I'm gonna take these same buckets that I've been using of students, alumni, and executives, because I think there are big opportunities here with technologies, it's not all threats. So I, I start out with personalized learning for students. So I brought to the school uh, the work I had done as a textbook author because I'd spent so much time on adaptive online learning. And there are certainly ways to take what looks like it's one size fits all, a technology solution, but actually have the student imagine that it is personalized because it is adaptive, because it is able to tell a student, you need to focus more here, less here, and so on. We're doing this in the pre-MBA in some of our MBA core work and it's, it's not something that's our own personal innovation as a school, but it's been very helpful uh, in, the, in the MBA program. It's also helpful in undergraduate uh, education where classes tend to be much larger than they would obviously for the, for the MBA program. For alumni, the opportunity really is content. Alumni really value touch points, and they value touch points on things that are current now. The frequent refrain I have from alums is, you know, I took marketing 30 years ago. What's it like today? Uh, what are the newest developments in uh, mergers and acquisitions? Or how do I think about different accounting standards? Whatever the question is, online is our way to do that. Because if you think about it, it's very difficult, at least my size faculty, to scale a solution for alumni. I have 47,000 alums. I only have 152 faculty. So for me to scale that, I need technology. It also allows us to give people something of value at really essentially zero uh, marginal cost. Uh, it is also important for us in, uh, we have internally a, what we call a 100 year work life project. I don't know that I'll live to 100. My wife has already explained to me I'm going to work as long as I'm alive, but what, whatever that period is. And, and we have tried to help people uh, figure that out over time. So we have uh, all kinds of evolution in new skills, digital healthcare, some work on behavioral economics, some of the work we do on board governance, for-profit, not-for-profit, as alumni go through their life cycle and portfolio uh, of activities. We also do a lot uh, in partnerships. You know, we have joint degree programs with London Business School, so we're also partnering with them uh, in, this, in this effort, too. And I think, for me, this is a genuinely exciting time because I'm optimistic uh, about two things. One, that business schools can do this. We are good at experiential learning, and as I said with the textbook example I opened with, if we do it well, uh, we're better than anybody else. The second observation I will make, and it's the subject of the essay that I mentioned, I do think we're still gonna see a continued shakeout uh, in the MBA industry. And the schools that make it are going to be the ones that figure this out. So let me stop there, but I would love to talk with you about any of that or anything uh, on your on your mind. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Hubbard. So I have the mic today, so anybody who has a question. Okay, I looked here, and then I'll go to Paolo. Okay, good. I was worried you guys need more coffee. It sounds like here's some questions. Okay. Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Michael Capella from Villanova University, and I'm curious um, your perspective on schools like yourselves getting into online education, because I think to your point, that would be a significant competitive threat for anyone that's not in the IVs. Yeah, well, it's a great question. Of course, it's not an academic question. HBX, Harvard Business School, has, has done this. Where we see online, we are not ever, well, I shouldn't say ever, uh, at least for the next few months while I'm dean, <laughs> I can say that, we're not going to offer online degrees. We are not trying to compete for an online MBA. But we definitely would like to offer content 
And so we already offer uh, suites of courses as certificates. And my aspiration would be, and, and other schools have done this too, that we offer essentially a core curriculum that could be used by others. Part of the world I see is that not just Columbia, but several business schools will be offering curriculum in the marketplace that may be used at other schools that then wrap other things they're differentially good at uh, around that. So I, I see it as a win-win. But we're, we're not going to be literally offering an MBA, but we definitely see content uh, as a big uh, area to grow. In exec ed, for example, it's what's enabled us to touch so many more people than we could ever have touched physically. I, uh, Paulo Goyes from the University of Arizona. You, you mentioned the competition coming from non-research-based uh, organizations, which means that uh, we should look at research as what differentiates us, what uh, makes us uh, attractive. Now, with all the changing uh, world and changing landscape, everything that we talked about, technology, artificial intelligence, how do we keep up with the research? Uh, what can we do to have our faculty generate the research that is important and relevant and timely that then can inform all these programs that, that you're talking about? It, it's a great question. Uh, the tagline I use for our school and I have all the years I've been dean is that what we think we're good at is bridging theory and practice. The universities are good at generating ideas. The practical world needs to inform those ideas. What at Columbia I think we can be differentially good at is we're sitting in New York. And so it's really easy for us to have this. And the way we've tried to do this for faculty, I've always said to them, marry rigor and relevance. When I say to you relevant, a lot of faculty think, oh, he means non-technical. That's not at all what I mean. I just mean solve the problems that people care about. When I was a graduate student, Marty Feldstein, who was my thesis advisor, said, Glenn, always be about the economy, not about the economics profession, and you'll do well. And I say the same thing to faculty. Go out and talk to business people in your area, find the problems they're trying to solve, and then you help solve them rigorously. And that is what we can do. Now, how do we do that? At our school, we have every research center has a board of advisors that come from the world. And we try to pick people who have intellectual curiosity but a deep interest in practical problems. So if somebody is studying, I don't know, I'll just make up an example, alpha among hedge funds, we will bring in people who study that in industry to try to inform the faculty member before he or she does it. It's also, by the way, for us, a great source of private data. So some of the most pleasant conversations I have is a faculty member coming to me saying, God, I wish I could study X. And my being able to say to them, well, you know what? We've got an alum who works in a company who has data on that, and I think I can help you. So I think we, we can do this. For research to be important, though, it has to be brought into the classroom. So it can't just be that we go off and do our scholarship. If we want to play at the table against corporate universities, we have to bring it to the classroom and show why it's so important to have the guy or gal in front of the room be a scholar, as well as just a good communicator. Um, Mike Malafakis, Wharton, formerly from Columbia. Um, the, the need to be a, adaptable, as, as you've highlighted, how do you, what tips do you have given that the human capital of, the primary human capital within business school is so rigid, it's not a flexible, adaptable human capital with the tenure system. So given that we have fixed capital assets, and there's rapid change in the market demand. How do you influence the fixed capital assets to be more market oriented? It's a great question. It reminds me of so many conversations, Mike, you and I had together over the years about how to do exec yet. Tenured faculty are our greatest asset and our, our greatest uh, challenge sometimes as, as deans because think about it. I, I remind my colleagues that they're essentially engaged with me in an unnatural act. So I happen to be on a long-term loan from the Department of Economics in Arts and Sciences. And when I teach in economics, many of those students might actually want to be me. So it's a natural act. When I teach in business school, they want to be Henry Kravis. They don't want to be me. And so I think what faculty need to do is imagine how do you bring everything together in business? So how do we do this? You pick a handful of faculty who really want to do this, and you encourage it and reward it and you try to lower transactions costs. I'm always a believer that no faculty member is going to do something just because I tell them to do it. 
But actually, many people are curious. And if I just lower transactions costs, I'll give you an example. We were talking at the breakfast table about team teaching. Team teaching can be hard because the issue of credit comes up. So when I mentioned working with engineering, we also do it with law and medicine. I went to those deans and I said, okay, I'm gonna give my faculty member full credit if you give yours full credit. We're gonna solve the credit and blame game problem. And by doing that, suddenly more faculty stood up and said, hey, I'd like to try that. Because you're gonna give me full credit for working with this new and interesting person. So I don't think you can ever make faculty do it, but what you can do is make it so interesting and so easy that they'll try it. And frankly, I said I have 152 faculty members. If I have a third of them interested in the game, I'm fine. You know, if I don't get the other two thirds, well, I'll, I'll still be fine. Yeah. Hi. Uh, good morning. My name is Vijay Kumar. I'm from Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond. And what I see is, or what I ought to see is, business schools actually, uh, academe leading industry. But what I observe in practice is that business schools and academe in general follow industry. We are not the trendsetters out there. We try to take something that industry is, the world outside has developed and maybe try to do it better. And we, we, we teach strategic planning. What do we do internally in terms of looking ahead to see where sh should business schools be five years ahead, ten years ahead, so that we could lead industry instead of following industry? Great question. Again, to, to, I'll pull my own Oprah Winfrey moment and tout my own essay. If you ask me, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll email to you, I'll tell you where I think it's going to be five or ten years from now. But you, you raise a great question. There was a time when we led. So let me take you back to that time. Is it still in my lifetime? So I once asked my finance professor in graduate school, John Lintner, who sadly passed away a long time ago, uh, how he thought of the capital asset pricing model, which he did with Bill Sharp and John Lintner, the founders of the CAPM. And he said, well, it was simple. I was teaching, and these people would come to me and describe these problems in asset pricing they were trying to solve, and I just used my toolkit to do it for them. Options pricing. That can, starting with finance examples, this is my area, that came out of universities, not out of Wall Street. And even in strategy, people like Michael Porter, who's an economist, who were the developers. Now, the question for today, I keep reminding my colleagues, I like reading the New England Journal of Medicine because it's, it's accessible even to people like me who aren't physicians, but doctors wait for the New England Journal of Medicine. They want to read it. And I keep looking at my colleagues and saying, let's be honest with ourselves. How many of uh, the world is waiting to read the American Economic Review? Journal of Accounting Research, or any, any, I'm not picking on any discipline. If we want to be relevant, we have to marry rigor and relevance. I'm not going to name these schools, but you'll probably figure out what I'm talking about. Let's take two schools. One is located in the heartland of the nation and focuses on ideas for their own sake, irrespective of their application, their applicability. Another school is on the East Coast, might even be my alma mater. It is actually codifying what business people think. Neither of those sound like the answer to your question. The reason I said bridge to th between theory and practice is at least what I wanted to do with my own school is to be in the middle. Take the question, go back to what John Lentner said. Take the questions business people are asking, but answer them with the rigor of a scholar. If you do that, you win. And I think people will start looking for our work the way doctors then look for the New England Journal of Medicine to come out. Yeah. I'm Sue Jin Kwan from Michigan Ross. I was intrigued by your emphatic statement that Columbia is not going to be starting an online MBA program, at least in the next few months that you're going to be. At least till June 30th, yeah. Yes. Um, and as you may know, Michigan Ross is about to launch an online MBA program next fall. I'm curious what CBS's rationale for not entering that space is. We didn't want, and, and each school, I mean, the fact that we make a decision doesn't mean it's wrong for somebody else. Our belief was the MBA means something particular. It is a highly experiential uh, program. And when I go out and talk to young people about MBAs, I would say you ought to be looking at an MBA program for ideas, talent, and network. Ideas of the person leading the discussion, the talent, the men and women by you, uh, and the network. That's easier to do in a blended format or, or strictly physical. We also didn't want to create flanker brands. You didn't want people thinking there are two different ways at different price points to consume a Columbia product. So I would guess where all business schools will go over time, including us, would be to have more blended 
learning. I already described how we do it in the required curriculum in the pre-MBA, but at least for us, the online MBA was not something we would do. It doesn't mean that we wouldn't ultimately do, as this gentleman over here had asked, things like selling curriculum into a core so that you could do the core. Wharton has their core available as well. So those are, are different solutions. So there's no, there's no right or wrong, but that's our, our thinking, or at least the, till June 30th thinking. I'll take one more question. Jens. Uh, thank you for your comments. I'm Jens Molbach. I run a nonprofit called Win Win, but come out of the private sector. I'm curious with your background in government and also leading a business school, what roles you see business schools can be taking to more um, effectively um, help you know, the societal functions of government work? Because it seems like you have a unique perspective. It's a great question. We have done some executive education in government, and we've had government folks and Defense Department and others uh, in exec ed programs. Government tends to be hard. I mean, I, I'll give you a good example. It's actually not the federal level. It's more the state level. Uh, my former colleague and friend Mitch Daniels, when he was governor of Indiana, really used business school ideas to transform what the state did, everything from the Department of Motor Vehicles to how it managed highways and so on. I think there's a huge opportunity for us to do that with the Office of Management and Budget, not at the policy level, but the doing what you do better level the way Mitch did uh, in, in Indiana. Your question raises a broader thing to me too, that business schools really are not always as involved in society as they should be. If we see, it's not, I'm not making a political observation of saying a policy is good or bad, but being able to use management to solve things. Remember, most big problems are not problems that we don't know what to do. They're problems that we are not doing it in the right way. So to give a, a dated example, but it's a big one, the Marshall Plan was both championed by business people and business schools and actually carried out using business people and business faculty being shipped to Europe. Uh, so I, I think that we're missing that opportunity both as business leaders, private sector people, but also us in business schools to play on that stage. And the reason it's important is our students want us to do that. Whenever people wring their hands to me about young people today, I think they're totally wrong. I feel blessed to be around the students I'm around because they are more socially concerned and engaged. They're, they're not just concerned with the job they have, but wanting to use their skills on bigger, on bigger problems. So I think we're punching below our weight. That's the cane. Thank you. Thanks for having me.